For this video, uh, part of my NCA exam prep foundations of law, uh, Canadian foundations of law study guide, is going to give a summary by using excerpts from the Arrested Injustice article from the streets to the prison, policing black lives. All credit, all copyright goes to the author Robin Maynard from the University of Toronto. Um, in this excerpt already from, uh, was given to us by the NCA exam foundations of law syllabus. Okay, let's get started with some of the key points that I have extracted from this 31 page article. Black folks, as well as being more likely to be stopped in question, are more likely than the general population to be charged, severely sentenced, and incarcerated in jails or prisons, and are less likely to be granted parole. Black life has been so effectively stigmatized that even highly spectacular forms of state violence are largely unrecognized as such and go uncontested by much of mainstream society. In the name of public safety, Canada has abandoned ever-increasing rates of black populations from state protections and from participation in social, economic, and political life and has undertaken a renewed investment in targeting black communities which are widely regarded as criminal. Defenders of the status quo have argued that blacks are not unjustly profiled, policed, and incarcerated because of their race, but because they are, in fact, more likely to break the law than whites. The history of racialized surveillance, policing, and incarceration in Canada was also profoundly shaped by and geared toward the aims of settler coloni colonialism. The imposition of forcing indigenous persons onto reserves and then beginning in 1846, residential schools were the initial modes of confinement leveled at indigenous persons, confining indigenous populations onto tiny portions of land and attempting to destroy political sovereignty and traditional relationships to land to clear the way for settler societies and resource extraction. In recent years though, the criminal justice system, particularly law enforcement, jails, and prisons, have, has become a primary means of settler violence over indigenous bodies. Criminal control remains an integral part of conquest. Indigenous persons now make up a substantial proportion of those held captive in Canada's jails and prisons, while representing around 5% of Canadian society they make up almost one quarter of the current total inmate population Canada-wide. This is a rate of incarceration even higher than that of Canada's black population. Both historically and in the present, policing blackness occurs alongside and as part of the policing of Canada's indigenous communities. Assertions of racial profiling or systemic racism continue to be vehemently denied by most police leaders. The assumption then that black people are likely to be criminals results in more black people being watched, caught, charged, and incarcerated. It is black people who will be made into criminals by the very policing strategies that target them. Young black people in Toronto reported being stopped, documented, and then told to leave neighborhoods in which they did not reside. The Toronto Police Service has steadily amassed the names, personal information, and movements of millions of people using contact card stops from largely non-criminal encounters. This practice, known, wise, known widely as carding, has been used to create a massive, known to police database of the citizenry, which is not subject to outside oversight or any regulation on the purging of information. Well, racial profiling can be understood as a ritualistic low-level violence inflicted on black communities, it is the war on drugs that has been instrumental in placing so many black communities in captivity within jails and prisons today. Amid growing racial and economic disparities, fear-based policies allowed states to exert control over their disenfranchised populations and to quell discontent under the banner of security. 
Indeed, the anti-crime focus of the last several decades has been, in part, a reactionary response to racial and social justice movements. Black women, though arrested in smaller numbers than black men, were found to face even more disproportionate rates of incarceration than men. By the end of 1993, black women were incarcerated at a rate of seven times that of white women. Prison expansion was given fiscal priority at a time when the government enacted significant austerity measures. Social investments were cut across nearly every other sector besides prison and the military, including education, childcare, welfare, pensions, union wages, women's groups, homelessness, prevention programs, HIV and hepatitis C prevention and treatment, and community support organizations for, immigrations, for immigrants and indigenous peoples. Spending on federal corrections grew more than 70% between 2003 and 2013, and prison spending exceeded $2.75 billion in the peak spending years of 2013 to 2014. This accelerated with the 2012 passage of legislation requiring mandatory minimum sentences for trafficking marijuana, along with numerous other nonviolent crimes. The practice of imposing mandatory minimum sentences has been documented to be ineffective on reducing crime and very harmful toward incarceration rates of marginalized and racialized communities. Law enforcement of the buying and selling of drugs allow for a significant level of discretion in policing, as both buying and selling drugs are consensual activities for which, by and large, no one calls the police. This means that the intensified focus on drug policing comes not from any community or socially determined need, but from the police or higher political powers. The decision of whom to search, survey, and arrest lies entirely in the hands of law enforcement officials. A 2012 survey by the Canadian Alcohol and Drug Use Monitoring Survey, which interviewed uh, over 11,000 individuals, found that white youth used more marijuana than black youth at a rate of 44.9% um, uh, compared to 38.7%, and they were nearly three times more likely to use cocaine. In addition, a study of youth in Toronto found higher rates of marijuana and cocaine use among white students as compared to black students, and noted that white students were slightly more likely to be selling drugs than their fellow black students. Black youth, then, are far more likely to be arrested and jailed for a crime that is much more prevalent among white youth. A high-profile study examined the scientific evidence on public health issues stemming from drug prohibition in 2016. This study confirmed that it is drug prohibition, not drugs, that has contributed to an enormous loss of life and lack of safety, including lethal violence, criminal networks, the spread of HIV, Hep C, and overdose deaths. And this has created numerous barriers to health as well as committing human rights violations. Using heavy law enforcement against minor suppliers and couriers to control or stop drug use has been consistently, has consistently been found to be completely ineffective. Black communities are not only fearful of being stopped or harassed by the police. Black communities live in a state of heightened anxiety surrounding the possibility of bodily harm in the name of law enforcement. Findings demonstrated that black populations face a rate of violence by police that is more than five times that of the white population, and they were subject to rampant and frequent abuse with little or no access to recourse. Black people continue to be killed by police in situations that could have been de-escalated by other means, and often due to police interventions that would not even have occurred had they been white. Beyond targeted police profiling and violence, this discrimination continues all the way up the courts. Black-white disparities can be found in pretrial detention and release conditions, including bail and sentencing. For nearly any crime, not only are people of African descent more likely to be arrested, but they are also much more likely to be detained pretrial, to have restrictive bail conditions, and to receive longer sentencing for the same charge. Black prisoners have lower parole grant rates, so they are released later in their sentences than other inmates. They also receive fewer temporary absences, and despite 
having a lower risk of reoffending are more likely to be held in maximum security institutions. Given the rising rate of people with mental and cognitive disabilities behind bars, prisons are even less equipped to rehabilitate mental illnesses and are frequently causing people further harm and making societal reintegration even more difficult. Instead of investing enormous amounts of public resources toward law enforcement and incarceration, prison abolition advocates aim toward societal transformations that would radically address the roots of social ills, including racial, gender, and economic inequalities. In a world defined by rampant, growing economic and racial inequality and increasing incarceration rates, it is only by aiming toward transformative rather than punitive forms of justice that we may begin to imagine a society in which black communities do not rot away inside juvenile detention centers, jails, and prison cells. Thank you for watching my video. Please do me a big favor and hit that like button and subscribe to get more videos on uh, law school and NCA exam prep.